50 years ago, our lives took a big pivot. My brother Tim and I got a chance to explore the wild mountain country of Canada's far north. It was all new adventure for us, and it happened on a grand paddle down the South Nahani River with our dad. That's Tim on the left, dad, and me on the right. As it turned out, the river trip fired up our imaginations and rerouted our lives. In June of 1974, the Bytown Bushwhackers, an Ottawa-based wilderness paddling club, set off to paddle down the South Nahani River, from Rabbit Kettle Lake downstream to Nahani Butte. For us, the Nahani trip represents wild adventure, those 230 miles of Wilderness River have hot springs, the giant Virginia Falls twice the height of Niagara, and deep 3,000-foot canyons, making it the Grand Canyon of the North. The Bytown Bushwhacker team is our dad, Jay Turner, Stu Hunt, Henry Hominick, Ian Ritchie, Tom Swaby, Tom Skinner, and Ron Niblett. And invited along on the trip are Tom Swaby's son, John, as well as Tim and I. And though we didn't appreciate the significance of it at the time, Tom Swaby's brought along a Super 8 movie camera and is recording the trip. And Dad, as always, has his camera and is shooting lots of pictures. And that's how this movie came to be. Fifty years later, we rediscover Tom's movie and combine it with Dad's photography and Mum's photo album to tell this story. For Tim and I, we're thrilled to be on this trip. Though we've never paddled anything like the Nahani River, we'd grown up canoeing and portaging with Dad the lakes of Algonquin Park in Northern Ontario. It was Mom that lit the candle for this trip. She'd read R.M. Patterson's book, Dangerous River, telling of his adventures on the Nahani in the 1920s. And that got Dad interested. And when he heard the bushwhackers were planning a Nahani trip, he jumped to get us on it. On a day in late June 1974, we arrive in Yellowknife Northwest Territories from Ottawa by way of Winnipeg and Churchill and on our way to Fort Simpson and finally Rabbit Cattle Lake in the upper reaches of the South Nahani River. This is all brand new for us. Yellowknife, a hard-nosed frontier town, the Arctic sun that never sets, and the almost treeless rock-bound landscape. Our flight onwards to Fort Simpson on the Mackenzie River is delayed a day due to bad weather, but the next day, it's a go. We arrive at Fort Simpson on the giant and fast-flowing Mackenzie River, where float planes are the way you get around. Our first stop is Albert Faley's cabin, hoping to meet the legend profiled in the National Film Board's movie about the Nahani. That movie, which had just riveted us, chronicled Faley's epic quests to find the gold hidden in the Nahani. But sadly, we learned that Faley had just died that winter. We pick up our canoes at the Hudson Bay Company Depot, 17-foot Grumman's, the trusty aluminum workhorses of the North. After another day's delay because of poor weather ahead, the pilot says it's a go. It is just amazing how much you can load into a Twin Otter. Dad, Tim and I are on the first flight in. There's fresh snow in the mountains. Snow in June, that's all new for us. Of course, so are the mountains. Oh my gosh, look at the Nahani's canyons and side canyons. They're just almost impossibly steep cuts into the earth. The upper Nahani, however, is completely different. Here the river meanders within a broad mountain valley. And then the plain banks, and we land on Rabbit Kettle Lake. The second flight with the rest of our crew follow later in the day. As the plane takes off, we're left alone in a big, vast quiet. 
and the whole trip lies ahead. The ragged range with granite peaks to 9,000 feet surround us on three sides. The lake, it turns out, is full of grayling. We've never seen anything like them with their giant dorsal fins, but they fight hard and oh, they taste good. The next morning, the hot topic is how to get to Rabbit Kettle Hot Springs. From everything we've heard, they are stunning. They aren't far away, but we'll have to bushwhack to get there. However, that afternoon, we're defeated by a fast-flowing river we just can't cross. Today, we're trying to get to the hot springs again. And after a tricky stream crossing, we're climbing a stunning gray dome that rises 30 meters above the spruce forest. The hot springs deposited this gray limestone over thousands of years, building a mound 75 meters across. Up on top is an open hole where the warm waters rise, and then flow across the flat top, spilling from one shallow terrace pool to the next. We know that the hot springs are delicate, but we just have to strip down and get into that pool. Tim and I have brought face masks and we take a look. The water is crystal clear and we look down into a narrow dark hole. This whole experience is just surreal. A tropical Caribbean feel, yet high in Canada's north. We just never expected this. Finally, we launch on the Nahani. It's a big, fast river. It's intimidating at first, but it's a smooth flow. We learn to read where the current's fastest to catch the best ride. The river whistles us along, and in two hours we cover about 15 miles of river. So different from lake paddling. I love our gravel shore camps, wide open and completely unlike forested Ontario, with big expansive views all around. And Dad is so in his element here. After a breakfast that includes Tom's now famous makeshift bannock, we're back on the river. Tom and John Swaby are together in a canoe, Tim's paddling with Ron Niblett, and I'm with Dad. That's Ian Henley and Henry Hominick up front, Tom Skinner and Stu Hunt behind them. And then the extraordinary of all of this catches up with me. Unbelievable. We're on the Nahani, legendary river of the north, in the wild heart of the Mackenzie Mountains. We've had wild creek crossings, grayling, snow-covered mountains, hot springs. <laughs> what an incredible adventure this is. Next, we catch a glimpse of a bear in a bar and head over to see its tracks. And then, Tom notices white dots on the dry slopes of the Sunblood Range. Are they mountain goat or bighorn sheep? We come upon the Zinchuk cabin that we'd heard about, inscribed into a log, N. Zinchuk, Trapper, September 42 to April 43. The river's undercutting the cabin, like so many banks on the river, and no doubt the cabin will be gone in a couple years. Hey guys, how about a group photo? We set camp on a gravel bar opposite a gigantic alluvial fan fed by a side canyon. After dinner, with lots of light left in the day, a bunch of us cross over and head up the creek. We angle up a scree slope towards some mountain goats and catch a great view of our river bar camp far below. Tim and I continue on up the creek for a mile, then head up a ridge. It's 11 p.m., but still lots of light. It's not yet twilight at midnight when we stop and take stock. Tim yodels to let the camp know we're okay. Going down, 
<laughs> we discover the joy of scree running. By 1 a.m. we're crossing the river to camp. And there's Dad waiting by the fire with hot chocolate for us. Hope he wasn't worried. The next morning dawns clear and warms quickly. From camp we can see the ridge we climbed last night. It is just so exciting. We're hooked. We love mountains. Looking back after 50 years, that midnight hike was the first big adventure Tim and I had on our own, without Dad. It was very cool to have to depend just on ourselves, and that really struck us. For days, we've been excited about seeing Virginia Falls. Today, we'll get there. And boy, do we eat well. On past canoe trips, Dad's been a minimalist with food. But our lunches here are Lebanese bread stuffed full with jam, apricots, canned meat, butter, and nuts. Wow! And then we hear the falls. We've been searching for that sound, knowing that Virginia Falls isn't that far ahead. This is the portage we don't want to miss. So nervously we line up our canoe single file, cautiously hugging the river's right bank. But the current's slow, the takeout turns out to be easy, even though the rapids start just 150 feet downstream. We walk the portage listening to the far off thunder, dropping down the long switchbacks to the shingle beach. Oh my, oh, oh, oh my, there it is, Virginia Falls. To the local Dene people, it is Nailacho, big water falling. The scale of the falls is hard to imagine. Two Niagara Falls stacked one atop another could almost fit between brink and river. This is the end of the wide open river that we've become used to and the beginning of canyon country. The rapids above the falls are in many ways more awe-inspiring than the falls themselves. They start gradually, but build into a sluice box of giant surges, standing waves, and 30-foot plumes of spray. From the head of the portage, we follow a path along the rapids and set camp on a pine bluff overlooking the incredible whitewater show. Tim and I have learned lots on this trip. Tom, Stu, Ian and Ron come with lots of outdoor experience. How to build a shelter from spruce poles and a fly, how to make campfire bannock, and that there are way better tents out there than the one we brought. The next day is warm and sunny, and we've planned to stay put at the rapids and falls. There's just so much here to explore. We find a rock ledge basin down by the rapids, washed by the occasional wave that makes for a good bath and laundry spot. We spend much of the day walking the shore continually astonished by the power and ferocity of the rapids as they tumble to the brink of the falls. We sit at the brink in awe. So much power, energy, beauty. Downstream of the falls lies Five Mile Canyon or Fourth Canyon. With the reputation as the toughest stretch of white water, we'll need to paddle on the Nahani. For Tim and I, white water is all new territory. Later, I sketch a map of the rapids and falls, hoping to remember all its details. I just never want to forget this place. And Tim feels the same. Today, we want to climb Sunblood Mountain. Stu, John, and Tom go ahead. 
Tim, Dad, and I follow half hour later. We paddle the river, and then it's a mile walk to the base of the mountain. We dump our long pants and head up in shorts, avoiding the loose scree, which just too much backsliding. <laughs> up on top, we're just exhilarated. We've never climbed a mountain before and the view of the rapids and falls below is just stunning. Well, today's the day we cross the portage and run the rapids of Five Mile Canyon. We're all a bit on edge. Before we go, we take a look at Albert Faley's high cache at the beginning of the portage and his famous scow. Scenes from the movie flood back to us. Faley hauling the planks for his scow one by one up the portage switchbacks to rebuild the boat here. Down on the beach below the falls, we install the spray skirts on the Grummans. The spray skirts are homemade, designed to cover the forward two-thirds of the canoe. This is their maiden voyage, but they look okay. We gather for a photo. I'm nervous as hell. Everybody's tense, but everything is businesslike. We listen closely to those with whitewater experience. Ron Niblett outlines our strategy based on earlier trip reports. Split the plumes on the second reach. Avoid the six to 10 foot standing waves just above Marengo Creek. Three, two, one, we launch. Stu and Tom in the lead. The rest of us follow their line. Fast and choppy on the first stretch, split the plumes on the second. Found a place to eddy out and take stock. Never saw the six to 10 foot standing waves, but boy, there were some big ones. We stop at Marengo Creek for lunch and celebrate. The toughest of the Nahani is behind us. We're thrilled. But wow, did we need those spray skirts. Downstream is a fast, bouncy ride. We come around a wide gravel plain and suddenly figure eight rapids is right ahead of us. So we quickly pull in. There's nowhere to camp at the portage, so we paddle back upstream to the big gravel flats. Figure eight rapids is created by the river taking two sharp turns one after another. The first turn throws the river against the rock wall shore, focusing the flow into a jet of fierce standing waves that shoot across the river and into a second rock wall. Upstream and downstream of the jet are giant circular eddies, creating the figure eight shape. The downstream eddy pulses with great upwelling boils, 30 feet across or more. The debate this evening is, should we run the rapids? The consensus, no. To navigate the rapids, a canoe must get out of the jet and into the lower eddy or be smashed against the second rock wall. It's just too risky. The next morning, we ferry our gear to the portage. I'm heading back for another load when I pass dad coming the other way. He looks at me and says, if you want to run the rapids, take these two paddles back across. Dad and I enter the jet tight to the first cliff, go through some big bouncing standing waves, then draw hard and just catch the edge of the Big Eddy. Oh my gosh, it worked! Though later we found out that three giant boils had occurred just before we entered the eddy. We pull into the end of the portage, elated. Oh, we know we were lucky. Our next stop is the junction with the Flat River, the great tributary of the Nahani. The Flat River is Faley's country. He had a cabin and a trap line way upstream. As tribute, Tim's taped Faley's famous words on their grumman. After dinner, Dad, Tim, and I line a canoe up the flat river, using the technique that Patterson describes in Dangerous River. 
We're searching for a cabin we've heard of and find one on the river's left bank. Someone has overwintered recently, as there's a Coleman stove, heater, broom, saw, all neatly placed. Today, we enter the canyons. Nothing has stirred our imaginations more than Patterson's descriptions of the Nahani's canyons. We'd got a glimpse of them as we flew in and, oh, oh my, they looked remarkable. Our maps show that the canyons occur where the Nahani cuts right through mountain walls, mountains that bear magical names, the Headless Range, the Funeral Range. As the mountains close in on us, we stop and get the spray skirts on. Back in the river, it feels like the Nahani is taking us deep into the earth. Suddenly, ahead, the river disappears through a tight-walled cleft. It's the gate. We stop and stare. The entire river turns hard and squeezes between cliffs that rise straight up from the river. We'd planned to camp here, and we find a forested bench just upstream. Dinner prep gets going. Ron makes a fire, and Ron and Tim are on meal duty. We notice that a bit inland, there's a softer slope that rises to the top of the gate. It looks hikeable. After dinner, Stewie and Ron, Dad, Tim and I pick our way up that forested slope. We come out on a ledge at the top of the gate. Holy Moses, the views are spectacular. And we get our first sighting of Pulpit Rock, looming high above the river, but from atop the gate, it seems tiny. And Stu just can't resist giving a loose rock a push. The next morning we launch, drift through the gate, and below Pulpit Rock. We stop at Patterson's Sandbar Camp, where he took the iconic photo of Pulpit Rock. Before the trip, we would marveled at that wild geography, and it gave great mystique to his Nahani explorations. Third Canyon is magnificent. And then, after a short stretch where the canyon walls recede, we're into Second Canyon. The rock cliffs pull back again, and we arrive in the broad expanses of Deadman Valley. This is a mythic place, where Patterson overwintered, where they found the headless bodies of the McLeod brothers. The great gravel mouth of Prairie Creek fills the north side of the valley, and we set our camp on one of its abandoned channels. We run into Don and Marianne Leahy from Ottawa, who we'd met further upstream and their camp nearby. In his book, Dangerous River, Patterson speaks highly of the Prairie Creek Canyon. So the next morning, we all head upstream. We are just amazed at the Prairie Creek's enormous gravel flats. Where the creek exits its canyon stands a stunning needle of rock. Just beyond the needle is what Patterson called the Hermitage, a tight canyon reach with soaring 300-foot vertical walls. Grayling are everywhere in the pools. We catch about 60, along with several whitefish and a small Dolly Varden trout, but we release just about all of them. Moving upstream is tricky, with bars that end in cliff walls, forcing crossings of fast creek water. Thankfully, the water's not too cold.
Tim and I leave the rest and work our way upstream, wading the creek and fishing the pools. I sketch our route as we go, hoping to hang on to the memories. The place is just magical. Late in the day, we all head back. We've kept four grayling and those get cleaned for dinner. We're all feeling pretty good about life. The next day we continue through Deadman Valley and enter First Canyon. Our first obstacle is Cache Rapids at the entrance to the canyon. So we beach our canoes on the gravel island above the rapids to take a look. We figure we can skirt the big water by going left. <laughs> but it's really hard to focus on the river. One to two thousand foot cliffs rise above us, brilliant in the sun. We float along. The sheer walls of First Canyon are magnificent. The river cuts through massive beds of limestone, creating stunning vertical walls. We come across a couple lining their way up river, Patterson style. They're three weeks out of Nahani Butte with another six weeks to explore. And they remind us that Polian lining was once the only way into the Nahani. That's why the canyons are named starting from the downstream one first. And we end our day with a camp on the big gravel fan at the mouth of Lafferty Creek, mesmerized by the many caves high above on the canyon walls. The next morning it's raining and the crew decides to stay put for the day. So Tim and I head up the canyon of Lafferty Creek. We bring a rope. We're hoping we might be able to get to a cave if there's an easy way up. A mile and a half upstream, as the canyon walls close in, the creek flows out of a slot in the rock, only five or six feet wide with 60 foot walls. We've never seen anything like it. So in we go. <laughs> what adventure! The grotto runs for a quarter mile, then it's blocked by a deep pool. So we swim it with our clothes held high above our heads. We build a fire under an overhanging rock to warm up, then pop back up into the larger canyon. Way up above us, maybe 700 feet on the canyon walls, are three caves near a forested slope that look accessible. After a 40 minute climb, we find the three foot wide ledge. We have a 50 foot rope. I tie myself to a spruce while Tim, roped up, goes ahead, ties off on a tree, and I follow. The first two caves are shallow and not interesting, but the third makes it all worthwhile. It's 100 feet deep with a high arching roof lit from above through a 100 foot sinkhole to the surface. The floor is covered with sheep tracks, but not a single human track. We may be the first modern people to enter the cave. We get back just in time for dinner. This is our last night in the canyons. Tomorrow will take us out into the flat country and the day after we finish the trip in Nahani Butte. We savor this evening amid the cliff walls. We're on the water early. We've got a long paddle today. With regret, we exit the walls of the first canyon and enter the expanse of a broad lowland. At Crows Hot Springs, we meet an Ontario naturalist party led by Fred Sibiston, a local trapper. He tells us that it was his cabin we visited on the Flat River. The Crows cabin has been taken over by Parks Canada and is being used by a University of Moncton team studying caves along the Nahani River. The whiff of sulfur leads us through thick bushes to three mud-walled hot spring pools. They're five to thirty feet across, a foot to four feet deep, with bottoms covered in a dense gooey algae. Even their enticing 96 degrees can't tempt us to get in. Next, the river splinters into the splits, a blizzard of channels running between gravel bars and islands. 
log jams are everywhere. The challenge is to stay with the main current as it splits and then splits again. We get our tents up just as it starts to rain. We're all somewhat deflated. The trip feels like it's over. Our last day is a long paddle down the now slow meandering Nahani River. But we make it to the settlement of Nahani Butte, the end of our trip. We find a jet boat able to carry the 10 of us, five canoes, and our thousand pounds of gear downstream on the Laird to Fort Simpson, where we catch a flight to Yellowknife and then home. Looking back across 50 years to our Nahani trip, it's so clear that it marked a giant turning point in our lives. Trips with Dad had glued Tim and I together, and we were ready to explore elsewhere. Our Nahani and Algonquin trips had given us the confidence that we could take care of ourselves in wild places. In the next few years that followed, Tim and I explored wild places from Oregon to Southern California. The Red Rock Canyon country of Arizona and Utah, and during a 10-month trip around the world, the Himalaya of Nepal, and the desert interior of Afghanistan. And since then, we've kept on wandering in wild places right up till today, in coastal BC where we make our home, and in the canyon country of the Colorado Plateau. Looking back, our Nahani trip showed us there was a big wild world out there to explore. And two, we needed time in those wild places, learning what they had to teach. And most important, that doing it together with each other was so much better. We're a great partnership. What a gift.